welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the Scriptures that have become more real to us so that we can draw more power from the Scriptures because we need that power. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and this is a special edition of the podcast. It's a joint broadcast with the Sunday on Monday podcast with Tammy Hall, sponsored by Deseret Book. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Sunday on Monday study group, a Desert Bookshelf Plus original, brought to you by LDS Living, where we take the Colony lesson for the week and we really dig into the scriptures together. I'm your host, Tammy Uzalak Hall. And also, welcome to the Scriptures Are Real, a podcast uh, by your, me, Carrie Mielstein, your uh, host for that podcast, where we look at elements of the scriptures that make them very real for us. And we're doing a joint podcast today. I'm so excited to be able to have this go to both of our, our uh, audiences as we discover, discuss and discover this together. Holla, it's going to be so good. I can't wait. Yeah. In this segment, we are going to talk about Ecclesiastes, and we're going to start with this quote, and this is from the Old Testament Seminary Manual on Ecclesiastes. Melinda, will you read this for us? Sure. It says, it is important to remember that the author of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, wrote it as if there is no life after death. These statements are made with that thought in mind and fail to account for truths about life after death taught elsewhere in the scriptures. Therefore, the writer of Ecclesiastes was not making a doctrinal declaration that nobody thinks, feels, or works after they die. He was simply illustrating the perspective on life after death for someone living under the sun with no understanding of life beyond mortality. And that's from the Old Testament Seminary Manual. Thank you. Thank you. Just so you know, I'm going to disagree with that at some point, but I, knew you I think I think in chapter 12, or is it, uh, what's the last chapter? Chapter 12, yeah, that at the very end, he shows us that's not what he's thinking, that he has been showing us the the way you would see it from this perspective, but then he gives us the real perspective at the end, so. Okay. That's, that's okay. Wanted, no, 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 this is they, so They good. love it at SNI when I disagree with them. They're, they're always happy about it. Well, that. maybe the manual is a little outdated. Are. There's been more scholarship since then. Just Terry, a especially. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, no, I'm, that's why I wanted to start with this, because when you read this and then you dive into Ecclesiastes, it's sort of like, wah, wah. It's such a, just a downer of a book, kind of, for me. <laughs> but Carrie disagrees. And so I love how we just start out with, I disagree. So Carrie, hit it. Teach us about Ecclesiastes. Go over like this, everything we need to know. Who wrote it, the structure, and stuff you like about it. This is your time to shine. You, this whole thing okay. is for you. So Ecclesiastes, it, it, the, the word is kohelet, uh, which means in a, in a congregation, an assembly, some a group that's been gathered together to hear something. And the person that is translated as the preacher here uh, is, is a, a kohelet, someone who has the ability to call together an assembly. Right. So this is just a, we it's translated as preacher by King James Version, because that's the kind of person that calls an assembly together to teach religious things. Right. So but it's just the, someone who has authority to call together a group and teach them. And uh, it's it's typically attributed to Solomon uh, because he talks about being a king in Jerusalem. Uh, who knows? It could have been Hezekiah, could have been anyone. But it's mm -hmm. a king in Jerusalem who builds a lot, ha is fantastically wealthy, is well known. And Solomon seems to fit that bill better than anyone. And Solomon is known for his wisdom and his writing and, and thinking things out and so on. So he's a really, really good candidate. But in the end, we don't know who this is. But whoever it is, this is someone who is trying to think their way through life. They're trying to say, all right, uh, I thought this is what was going to work, and it didn't. And I thought this is right. So this is that speculative wisdom literature I mentioned where we're trying to understand the meaning of life, the universe and everything. And uh, and he starts out by questioning the meaning of everything. And and so this first part absolutely is, according to that quote um, that we, we pulled from the manual, uh, the idea that if you're going to look at this from a purely mortal perspective, what in the world is the point? And that's a point that's worth all of us thinking about. If you are, I, I have to say, if I didn't have the gospel in my life, if I didn't know about God and how things are going to be after this, I would say that. What is the point? <laughs> but as the preacher, Solomon, whoever we want to call him, he talks about if you go to chapter one, um, verse three, what profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to its place where he arose. The wind goes towards the north and the south, and so on. Rivers run to the sea. And, and his point really is, uh, 
everything just keeps happening again and again. And we work so hard to become famous, right? And again, you kind of it's, it's can almost see him drawing from ideas from Egypt because in Egypt, what they wanted was for their name to be known forever and so on. And, and in our society today, fame is such an important thing. And how many hits can you get on your social media thing and whatever else, right? And, and so we work so hard to become famous. And his point is, uh, there were lots of famous people before us that none of us know anything about. And a couple of generations later, however famous you are now, no one's going to know anything about you. Mm. So why are you pursuing fame? Right. Then we get wow. to chapter two and he talks about wealth. So this is another thing that is really applicable to our society. I think Ecclesiastes is incredible, incredibly applicable to our society um, because fame and wealth seem to be the major concerns of our society. Mm -hmm. Right. So some societies, it's survival. Uh, but in in uh, many societies in the world today, it's fame and wealth. That's what we want, right? So wow. chapter two, verse one, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure and behold, this also is vanity. We're going to come back to vanity in a minute. So before he gets to wealth, he's like fun. There Now there's a, a, a something that's a concern in our society as well, right? We need to have fun. Entertaining ourselves to death is one of my favorite books, but uh, there, <laughs> there are all sorts of, uh, it, we really are just, gamers or uh, thrill seekers or binge watching or whatever. And I'm not saying any of that is bad in and of itself, but it, it's become a huge focus in our society. I almost feel like we're like the Romans going to circuses and uh, gladiator tournaments, right? We're just looking for the next thing to kind of divert us for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and verse two, he says, laughter is mad. Um, so then we, we get down into verse four where he's going to have vineyards and verse six, he makes pools of water and with the wood and he has servants and maid servants in verse seven and possessions of great and small cattle and gathered in me in verse eight, silver and gold and peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces and I had singers and men singers and women singers and delights of sons of men. So basically he gets everything, all the entertainment you could ever want, all the wealth you could ever want. He gets everything that the world has said is valuable. And this is so, again, we're so influenced by the world today and what the world says is valuable. Right now, the world's throwing in also like, this is the right way to think and the right way to act. And it has to be, you don't condemn anyone and all sorts of other things, right? Um, I like how he says about himself in verse nine. So I was great. Like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's how he says it in my head. So yeah. I was great. And I increased yeah. more than all that were before me. Like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I reached the top. What he finds is he put his ladder on the top of a very tall wall and he climbed all the way to the top. And then he found he was on the wrong wall. That's mm -hmm. really what he's saying because he yeah. keeps talking with all of this stuff. He keeps saying that it was vanity. Uh, and, and we saw that uh, in at the end of verse one, right? Behold, this also is vanity. It's the, the major theme that we get in Ecclesiastes. And, and the word means like it, it comes from the word for breath actually mm -hmm. but it's like something that is so fleeting right you breathe out and it's gone and it's that fleeting smoke, right Just, that's exactly right yeah mm -hmm. yeah that hebel is really a great word it's fascinating yeah yeah and that's what it is it's just as as quickly as breath comes it goes and and it's gone and that's what all of this stuff that the world is telling us to pursue is like uh it's all just it's fleeting and transitory. That's what the word means. And that's the theme of, of uh, Ecclesiastes. Everything the world tells you is important is actually so transitory, it's not worth it. Right Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do anything. And that's the nice thing about chapter three is there are times to do things, even though it's, it's vanity in some ways, right? So there's a time to be born, even though you're going to die, right? Life is fleeting, right? There's a, a, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. So we're even right in then you're going to plant something and that's going to grow. You might, you'll eat it. It's going to be gone or it's going to die. Uh, and so on time to build and a time to break down, weep and laugh. So you have to do all these things, even though in each case it ends, mm -hmm. they all end, but you still need to be doing them is what he's saying. So do what you need to do, but don't put your stock in that because it's vain, meaning it's so transitory. If that's what you're, if that's how you're trying to meet your needs, you're going to be sad, right? And I'm 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 working uh, very closely with some some people who are loved ones of mine, people I'm very close to right now who are dealing with you know lack of serotonin and things like that, and they're just trying to find how to meet their needs. 
And they just keep thinking, well, if I do this, it will meet my needs. Or if I do that, and they get that, and it doesn't meet their needs, right? And they get to something else, and it doesn't meet their needs. And you just kind of have to help them see none of those things are actually what meets your needs. You need to do them, but they're not what meets your needs, right? And, and really, all of Ecclesiastes is about that until we get to the very end. And that's where we get verse 13. And he, and he sums it up. He tells us he's summing it up. Right. He's, so the whole book you may think is a downer, Tamara, because it, it is. And he's trying to give us that feeling. All of these things, if this is what you pursue, your life's a downer. Mm -hmm. Your life is going to be one unending story of not having your needs met. Okay. So that is what we're going to do in the next segment. We are going to discuss the end. But before we do, can we just point out Ecclesiastes chapter three and the song from the birds in 1969. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like yes. I grew up with that as a kid and I loved that song. And then when I found out it was a scripture, I was like, what? Like <laughs> I remember as a kid. So turn, a turn, bit. turn. Sure. <sighs> as I was reading it, that song started going through my head. I, I, I can never read this without hearing them. Turn, never. turn, turn. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and Cammy, I got to say too, because I was thinking of that song so much as I was reading it. But I wish that they'd included the beginning of verse 11 in the song, because I think that line, he hath made everything beautiful in his time, is so touching. It's, yeah. it's what has to go with those verses. So mm. I just wanted to point that out. That's, that's maybe my favorite sentence, actually, in Ecclesiastes. I love it. That's oh, good. It is good. I'm with you. All right, birds, add that to your song. Someone needs to rewrite it and put that in there, because that would have fit. Yeah. Perfect. According to Ecclesiastes chapters 11 and 12, let's turn there. I just want to know, what did the preacher want the people to understand about their choices in life? Carrie, you just got so excited. I just want you to keep teaching us. Go, go with this. Well, so chapter 11 is wonderful because you've got this idea that, that part of what we should do is help other people. And even though they're also transitory from a mortal perspective, you still should be helping other people. But we know they're not transitory from an immortal perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, we get verse two, give a portion to seven and also to eight. And that's typical Hebrew poetry, right? Just one building on the other. Uh, it's like I've told you, I've told you three or four times, right? It's the same <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Um, so give give to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth and, and so on. But the idea is give to other people. You don't know what's going to happen to them. You don't know what has happened to them. Take care of other people. So that's the theme of, of chapter 11, which is uh, beautiful stuff. And I think maybe we should end that starting in verse nine. And I'd love to get your guys' input on, on how you interpret uh, verse nine and 10. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh for childhood and youth are vanity. There's some deep verses. Oh, yeah. boy. I needed to ponder on that a bit, but. Yeah. And I think, especially think of, think of them in this context that the most of the chapter is about helping people, right? Which is different than at the beginning, which was I gathered a lot of stuff for myself and I entertained mm -hmm. myself and I got wealthy. Um, and so I think that there's a contrast with those first several chapters and this idea of helping people, but th those last two verses, especially. Yeah, what, there's, but, there's definitely an element of maturity. I think it's really pointing out that at some point we have to put away childish things, right? Yeah. Kind of not scripture. Yeah, you, you're you not young forever. Yeah. Uh, I think it's part of what he's saying. You At some point, you're going to have to grow up and not gather for yourself, but for others. And be accountable. Of, yeah. Of what you chose to do. Sorry, what were you saying, Tammy? Well, I'm struck with walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou for all for, but know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. And, you know, it makes me think about times when I would be teaching seminary and kids will ask, well, I, am I going to be judged on everything I do? And what, and mostly it wasn't them. They were thinking about family members. Well, my uncle, like, you know, it was always these weird scenarios. Like yeah. he, he was an active member and then he had a head injury and then he didn't know anymore. And so they would ask all these questions. And that is so profound right there. We're walking the ways of your heart and in the sight of thine eyes. And I would always have them turn to doctrine and covenants. In fact, let's get there. 137, because I would say, well, let me tell you what the Lord will judge us on at the end. 
in section 137, I really appreciated how it would say what we were judged on. And um, we're going to start with, and it's in verse um, eight, actually verse nine, let's do this. Section 137, verse nine, for I, the Lord will judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their hearts. And I love that there's an allowance for that, like for the desire of our hearts. And it, it, it addresses that in verse nine, when he says, walk in the way of thine heart and also in the sight of thine eyes. Like I'm going to judge your heart and I'm going to judge your eyes. Like what you do and how you act in this life, it's all connected heart, mind, eyes, everything. Um, and know that that's what we're going to be judged on. And so it's sometimes I have the best of intentions in my heart, but I don't do my actions. And I hope that counts for something because yeah. I get busy and I just didn't get around to doing it, but I really did in my heart want to help. And I hope that that weighs, I hope that has some weight on my scales. <laughs> of course. And, and sometimes life gets in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You're right. Really yeah. Right. The striving and the seeketh so to do. There it is again. Yes. The seeketh so to do. Oh, I'm going to write that next to those two verses. Yeah. What was that yeah. reference again in section? It's in section 46. 46. I don't remember exactly the verse, but somewhere around verse 10 or something like that. No, it's later than that. Um, and up. again, I, I like this idea, you know, if you have, if you're doing right in your own sight, in your own eyes, uh, in your own heart, but you know, God's going to bring you into judgment. Hopefully then you're aligning your heart. And that's what he's going to talk about in verse in chapter 12. You're aligning your heart with God's heart. Then you're happy because you're doing what you want, but it's also going to work out well for you. Right. And, and, uh, uh, that's why if you're doing that in verse 10, you can remove sorrow from your heart mm -hmm. and put away evil from your flesh because you have that. So all of those verses tell us, no, he's got a bigger perspective here. Once you start talking about being brought into judgment by God, then it's not just about a mortal perspective. It, it can't be about uh, not thinking of an afterlife. It, God brings you into judgment in the next life. So if he's talking about judgment from God and he's talking about uh, the things that we're, we're about to look at and, and these verses 9 and 10, he's finally gotten to the point where he's looking at things from a larger perspective. And I don't think it's a, a mistake or a coincidence that he starts to hit that perspective right after talking about helping others, right? Because the world's going to tell you, help yourself. And God's going to tell you, and our covenant's going to tell you, help others. And there's a reason for helping others. And some of that is this larger perspective that he's getting us to. Well, and dare we say, this is the covenant keeping perspective. That's exactly like, right. That's oh, yeah. helping others is all about keeping our covenants. And so I think that's what he's kind of delving into is now as covenant keepers, how's that going to abode for you at judgment day? Yeah. Only well, it can it will <laughs> only be good. <laughs> yep. Yep. Totally. If you're just seeking to keep your covenant, right? That's what this asks. All right. So let's jump like actually almost to the end. Let's look uh, at verse eight, which is the summation of what we've heard so many times. Verse eight, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And really he's talking about just before that, he's talking about silver and gold and things like that. All of that is transitory. It doesn't matter how much, you know, the phrase we use all the time, you can't take it with you. What mm -hmm. is the point of gathering all this stuff if you can't take it with you? See, now I have an Alan Parsons song and I'm running through my head. But anyway, <laughs> um, but no, it's it, everything that's transitory is not worth your time is what he's saying. Just don't spend your time on the transitory things. You'll have to go through it. So it's not that it's not worth your time. Some things, chapter three tells us you have to go through these things. You have to build, you have to plant, you have to tear down, but that's not right. I, let's say it's not worth your heart. Mm. All these transitory things are not where your heart should be. It's not be, it shouldn't be where you're trying to take your joy or meet your needs. That's not what you're looking at. So verse 13, he gives us the summary. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. That's I, I don't know how you could be more clear than to say, this is how I'm summing up everything that I've said. Fear God. Now, here we're back to the same thing that we had in Proverbs, yeah. right? It's another reason why people think that there, there may be the same author here. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, if that's your commandments, duty should be a clue. We're talking covenant here, all right? Fear God, keep covenant. We could just rephrase it that way. Fear God and keep covenant, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And of course, I think what he's trying to say is do the good, right? Do your duty, do the good, and then all of that gets brought to light, and you don't have to worry about the evil. But for those who have not focused on keeping their covenant, then that's not going to be a good day, 
right? Again, it's the striving, it's the focusing, it's the seeking so to do. We can't forget that part. But really the point of all of this is don't get your heart set on the wrong thing. Don't put your ladder on the wrong wall. Keep your focus on keeping your covenant and having a relationship with God, which is what a covenant is really about. Have that relationship with God, keep your covenant, and this is going to work out well for you. Mm -hmm. If I could wisdom. only, yeah, that is wisdom. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's it. That's, That's wisdom. wisdom. So if I, I could only a get these people I know who are trying to find different ways to get their needs met to understand that, oh, what a game changer it would be for them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I have a question for both of you then, a follow-up question with what you just said. How do you do that? Just on a daily basis, like today you've woken up, we've had our day. What are you going to do today that's going to help you to have wisdom or to keep your covenants? You know, I love building in and it just happens naturally in the way that we live our faith tradition and in, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but building in those touch points throughout the day, just habitually prayer in the morning with every meal at night reading your scriptures connecting with people um it just just this constant touch point even things on our walls that we see in our home that remind us just always bringing it back to jesus to really see jesus everywhere right mm -hmm. uh, great example I I agree 7223 percent with what <laughs> said. um I just I can't agree more. And then I would also say this, and this again comes back to, to covenant and maybe I've just been writing and talking about covenant so much lately that that's, I see it everywhere, but I think so does president Nelson. So I feel good about it. Yeah. Um, our, our primary obligations under the covenant are to love God and love man. And if I'm asking myself with everything I'm doing, what my motive is, because a lot of Ecclesiastes is really about motives. Was he acquiring all these things to help other people or to be the best and the greatest? And initially, it's to be the best and the greatest, right? So that may be an argument against Solomon because he seems to have very early on understood that what he was trying to do was for others. Um, and, and he's asking God to help him take care of Israel. So maybe it's not Solomon. In the end, I don't know. But, but the, at least the way Ecclesiastes is written, whoever this, this caller of the congregation is, he starts out doing things for himself. And he seems to realize he needs to be doing them because he loves God and he loves other people. And I think for me, that's, I have to ask myself my motive all the time, because even some things I start with good motives can really easily turn to, it's about me, mm -hmm. right? I can start uh, teaching, writing, whatever else with good motives. And pretty soon, well, I want people to think well of me. Mm -hmm. I want uh, people to, to think this or that of me. I want to be able to do this or that with it. And and if my motives shift that way, I've got a problem. And I have to go back to my and ask myself, why am I still doing this? Because I love God and I want to do what he wants me to do. Is my will swallowed up in his? And am I, do I love people? And I'm doing this because I want to help people, right? Why are we doing this podcast? Is it because we want a thousand hits or is it because we think there are people that could really be helped by this. And probably during the, the course of this podcast, we've, we've all had multiple motives, but we have to keep coming back and asking ourselves, is this because I love people and I want to do God's will because I love him? And that keeps me uh, on the right path with this uh, conclusion of the matter that the preacher is talking about more than anything else. And what helps me ask those questions are all the things that Melinda asked about. If I'm not praying regularly, I'm for sure going to forget those motives. If I don't have those little reminders all around me, I for sure forget those motives. Yeah. Beautifully spoken, both of you. That's, you're spot on. You're absolutely right. And those are great questions to ask ourselves. What are our motives? And we have moments like that where it can hurt a little bit. Because I remember when I was writing yeah. my book, my motives, I remember I finished writing and I had someone read it and they asked me, who's your audience? And I was like, what do you mean? And she says, it sounds like you're trying to write to professors and people who are scholars. And I was like, that's exactly who I'm writing to. And she <laughs> said, then it's a terrible book because nobody's going to read it. And she said, you need to rethink it, who your audience is. And that was crushing and the greatest moment because it really made me do just what you said, Carrie, I had to turn around and go, wait a minute. Yeah. The whole point is just to bring people to Christ. And my first draft was bringing nobody to Christ. It was a proof book. Like I'm proving, I'm, let me show you how much I know and what I can teach you. And then it 
completely shifted. It's not even the same manuscript. It really was, how can we bring people to Christ and have a desire to keep covenants and believe him and love him? And so, yeah, I, I, I was, you know what? All right. I repent. I was Ecclesiastes. I was great. I said that verse. Oh, look at me. I'm pretty great. I had to remember, oh no, it is completely about fearing God. So we've all been there and we all will be there. Well, good. Yes, we all have been there. And it's, it's a great book to help us call into question what our motives are, where do we stand? And are we ready for judgment day? So very cool. I love this now. That was a great discussion. You too. Mission accomplished. Woo. (laughs) That was great. Okay. So just gather your thoughts. I'll just say for me, the takeaway is a bit what we've just said. It's this idea of recognizing how great God is and how much he loves us. And then letting that inspire love in me. I'm thinking of in in, uh, 1 John where it says, we loved him because he first loved us. When we recognize his love for us, we'll love him. We'll love each other. And we behave differently when we do that. And we feel and become differently when we do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so good. Good so takeaway. Good. Yeah, as I think about everything we've talked about, I kind of go back to this one line from Proverb in uh, chapter eight, where it's the one time we get to hear wisdom speaking in her own voice, like in first mm-hmm. person, is in um, a, a series here. It's like 12 through 36. So most of that page is with wisdom speaking to us. But there in verse 35, she says, For whoso findeth me findeth life. And mm. that, that just sums it all up to me that really, this is the secret to a happy, good, not always easy, not always fun, none of those, but a meaningful life. It's finding that wisdom. It's living in that covenant relationship with Christ makes all the difference. Mm. That's what I think it's all about. I'm so glad you brought up chapter eight. Everyone go read and study chapter eight. That's probably the best proverb chapter. Oh, I so love beautiful. it. Thank you. Uh, For me, it was definitely, Melinda, what you taught us about wisdom literature. I thought that was so fascinating. And the background behind that and the history completely changed what I had already known about wisdom literature. So that was cool. And then I loved when, Carrie, you taught us how the Lord used this this style of speaking when he taught about, I didn't know the sitting at the table. And I thought that Mm. was so cool. So I can't wait to go study Luke chapter 14. I am going to study that. And then when you said that some of these Proverbs existed in Egyptian text. That's really cool. So thank you for paying the price to know about Egypt and Egyptology and the language and everything. So good stuff. Oh, that's just good, clean fun. <laughs> my life my life bucket list is to go to Egypt with Carrie. So oh, let's do it. Is that tour. Right. Let's do right. it. <laughs> yeah, let us know when you have an opening because oh, that would be so much fun. So All right. thanks, friends. 